Joaquin C. Joaquin. Hello, everybody. My name is Ane. I am Soto from Fishing Lake First Nation and Metis. I am a student at UBC, and I would like to note that this conference is being held on the ancestral and unceded territory of the Musqueam people. I have decided to start the conversation off today with a brief reflection on the subject matter of this panel. Dr. Nadine Karen invited me here today to present the student reflection, so I thought I would start by discussing the title, Learning with Indigenous People Towards Advancing Equity and Well-Being. So many things come to mind when I think about this phrase, so I'll begin with some thoughts on the topic of learning with Indigenous people. I often hear people talk about the need to implement initiatives that promote equality or inclusion. These types of initiatives can succeed in creating more inclusive environments and discussions, but they don't necessarily guarantee that Indigenous voices are being heard. The enthusiasm doesn't always succeed in creating spaces that promote learning from one another. I know that true learning requires listening and understanding. However, in my experience, this is a rare occurrence. Learning with Indigenous people towards advancing equity and well being for all people requires so much more than words. It requires so much more than performativity and talking for the sake of talking. It requires action and actions that have the ability to create real change. It is impossible to advance equity and well being when ind Indigenous voices are silenced and disregarded. Moreover, the inclusion of Indigenous voices does not guarantee that our voices won't be exploited or used for institutional gain. In order to create real change, people and institutions must be able to listen and learn. It is necessary to inspire new ways of thinking to break the barriers that prevent true learning and connection. It is, it's extremely important for people to look at things differently, to introduce different ideas and understandings. The legacy of colonialism today enables indig indigenous erasure and promote, promotes white supremacy culture. The lack of effort to learn from indigenous people is ingrained into these colonial structures. Dialogue without change is a continuation of colonialism. Change can only happen when society and institutions choose to listen, learn, and act on this. It serves absolutely no one to invite Indigenous voices into spaces that have zero desire to create the necess necessary change. Performative politics continue to sustain white supremacy culture and enable the inherent violence and racism that is directed towards Indigenous communities. The real change occurs when we can question current methods of conduct and improve them with tangible actions. Strong foundations are needed in order to support the relationships within communities. It serves all people to inspire values such as respect, responsibility, generosity, and honesty. Current health systems and government structures are built to serve Western ways. They have not and do not take Indigenous people and other minority groups into account. My friends and family suffer the consequences of colonialism and white supremacy culture every day at doctor's appointments, at medical clinics, at hospitals, in their own homes, on TV. Health and wellness systems have been set in place to work against us. How can we guarantee wellness when our bodies, our minds, our hearts are disregarded? People have to be willing to exercise the courage to elevate and fight for Indigenous voices. Institutions and rigid structures change when the people participate in creating that change. A tree is only as strong as its roots. We become stronger when we look out for one another. These systems can transform to promote better experiences for the youth. And I want to express how important it is to elevate programs that are creating positive change and to create spaces that amplify non-Western modes of conduct and leadership. Racism, discrimination, and destruction are issues that exist all around the world. The United Nations Declaration on the Rights of Indigenous Peoples affirms the individual and collective rights of Indigenous people in relation to the evolving international order. Indigenous people are leading the protection of global biodiversity and resisting environmental destruction. It is necessary to protect the environment, 
all humans and non-humans. However, performative state politics gets in the way of implementing lasting structural change. We can all hold colonial structures accountable in order to create positive change. This is currently being demonstrated through the solidarity of Indigenous communities across the globe against oppressive structures. Indigenous organizations are pushing back against these inherently racist and heteropatriarchal colonial structures. These structures demonstrate that they are unwilling to learn from Indigenous populations and advocate for alternative systems. Politicians and decision makers have a habit of participating in performative morality instead of creating spaces for real change. This pattern is dangerous to Indigenous communities and marginalized groups who continue to navigate through colonial violence and structural racism. Current discussions surrounding the topic of change and relationship building in the Western world tend to dismiss all of the other perspectives and experiences that do not conform or align with their agenda. The navigation of racism, discrimination, and exploitation in the, field, in the medical field is a reality for many. This experience is not limited to medicine and extends deeply into all institutions. Indigenous knowledge and ideas can address the exploitation and destruction that continues to take place across the, across the globe. It is necessary to learn, deconstruct, and improve. The future is decolonized. Finally, I'd like to introduce the panel. Um, the first panelist is Dr. Danielle Ben-Smith. Danielle is Echo Dene of Fort Nelson First Nation and Métis with roots in the Red River Valley. She currently serves as Deputy Provincial Health Officer, Indigenous Health BC Officer of the Provincial Officer. She's a senior health leader who is involved in BC's COVID-19 response, including the through engagement with FNHA, Métis Nation, and other collectives across the province. The second panelist is Christopher Horse Thief. Christopher is an educator and organizational theorist specializing in complex systems and social processes, intelligence problem solving systems, and post traumatic community resilience. For 27 years, Christopher has been facilitating field analysis of the relationship between culture and communication, documenting the dynamics that pose challenges to Indigenous leaders and drives language revitalization. The third panelist is Dr. Nadine Karen. Nadine is a member of the Sagamok Anishinaabek First Nation. She is a practicing surgical oncologist in Northern BC and the sole Indigenous physician within BC Cancer. She's the only Indigenous academic faculty member within UBC, UBC School of Medicine and a professor at UBC Northern Medical Program and Department of Surgery, as well as a senior scientist at Canada's, Canada's Michael Smith Genome Sciences Center at BC Cancer. Please give them a warm welcome. Thank you. Okay. We can just start. I think so. Okay, wonderful. <laughs> um, Masi, Marcy, Anne, for your words and for, mm -hmm. for your welcome and introduction. Um, Danielle Dishnakoshin, Sezitla, Danielle, and Michithnia P. Dene At A. Fort Nelson, Oceania, P. Winnipeg, Oceania, Lekwungen Territories, Niwikiniqua, Anach, uh, Musqueam Territories, Diane, Maparantikayash, uh, Oshchadariverush, Kioschevak, Minon de Famille, Messon, Bain, Dumen, Faneuf, Lamirant, Nimuiten, and Nekaskitek. I'm very honored and pleased to be with you guys this morning and really thrilled to be able to use those little bits of my languages, which um, we've just been learning in our family. Um, we're learning the Chif and Dene, so I'm so grateful for the opportunity to practice a little bit of that this morning with you guys. Mm -hmm. uh, I'm uh, so great to see you again, Danielle, and Christopher, it's so great to meet you. Uh, we had a chance to Zoom before this, uh, and um, so wonderful to move from the Zoom world over to uh, a little bit of reality. I find that I'm always most shocked by the height of people, uh, <laughs> where you really don't get to appreciate that on Zoom. Um, my name is Nadine Caron. Um, uh, Nanman Mwamke is my traditional name. 
Um, I am a member. Thank you, Anne, for a beautiful, beautiful, thought-provoking introduction. Um, and uh, I, but I live, work, play. Um, it may not look like it this morning, but I do sometimes sleep uh, on the traditional <laughs> ancestral and unceded territory of the Clay Tene, which is up in one of the most colonial terms, really. Um, sometimes I chuckle, um, Prince George, British. Columbia. It's like on one spectrum and then the other spectrum. But uh, thank you so much. I'm really excited to, to have a conversation today at what looks like it's going to be an amazing conference. University of British Columbia. <laughs> Uh, uh, health policy and health research. Um, I noticed that it did not say Dr. Christopher Horsethief. I'm a uh, doctoral faculty in mm -hmm. two uh, doctoral programs uh, working on issues of uh, leadership, social justice, better quantitative and qualitative research. Uh, I just introduced myself uh, in my community said I was happy to be here uh, at UBC, my old foes, uh, and uh, happy to be here to kind of talk and listen and see what's uh, happening here in terms of uh, health policy and health research. I, yeah. I don't know if I can just jump yeah. in, but I was so moved by so many of the things that you said, Ana, and some of the words that stuck with me were exploitation and learning. And um, at the BC office of the provincial health officer, we've started this new program, project, piece of work um, in the last year that has been so invigorating for me because we are, for the first time in the 20 odd years that I've been working in health, we're centering white supremacy and racism. And so the work, we refer to it as unlearning and undoing white supremacy and racism in service to demonstrating trustworthiness. And so I was so struck by those words because I thought that's, you know, at the core um, of this topic, um, learning with Indigenous peoples, there's, in my opinion, so much work that needs to happen for settler colonial systems institutions, settlers to demonstrate their trustworthiness before they can even have the privilege of for example, listening to teachings from Dave Frank and Nola this morning, like those were sacred words that um, that were shared. And um, in our work, I'm just realizing in our office where we're, I mean, we're highly committed and yet white supremacy and racism are so deeply embedded into everyday processes, the everyday things that we do that, um, yeah, we just need to show up every day and demonstrate our trustworthiness to um, addressing and arresting racism and white supremacy. So that's what I've been thinking about a lot in advance of this conversation this morning is thinking about all that prep work that needs to happen where we actually center um, settler settlers, settler colonial institutions and their everyday practice. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. Well, the, the work you're doing. Danielle is is amazing, and I've been hearing about it uh, through through the grapevine uh, heading heading up uh, north. And it's really interesting, like um, when you you're trying to walk that balance between um, the colonial institutions uh, and the Western measures of anything from success to what health is, and you realize at the same time is trying to stick to those roots. Uh, of the trees that you were referring to NA, in terms of where the strength really lies um, and then balancing that. And um, today, this morning, um, there's uh, a, a class that I'm a part of and uh, we're, we're uh, just across the street, really. Where's the class? If you wanna put up your hand from the Center for Excellence in Indigenous Health, it's embedded Yay. within UBC, but then if you look around at this group, first of all, thank you to McWitch for coming and joining, but it's a class where it's really confusing because there's like so-called faculty 
and then there's like staff, and then there's a TA, and there's a, a work learn student like a NAE, and then there's students. Um, and those are all titles that the university gives. Mm -hmm. But if you were to just walk into the classroom and just sit there and listen, it would be, in my mind, absolutely, you would not be able to persist, like, who is faculty, who is staff, who's a student, who's a learner, who's a TA, who's the leader, like, it's all, it just, it's so, so different. Um, and it's, it's beautiful because we always, we always sort of say, I, I come away with how much I learn, and we're talking about the determinants of health not just the classic one that you hear about um, at you know an introductory public health lecture but indigenous perspectives in the determinants of health and then in the afternoon we're learning about research ethics with indigenous peoples through an indigenous lens um, and it's just an example of two classes where we're trying to do it in a colonial institution in a space that has like things like you have to you have to mark something um, and uh, and you have to you have to register and you have to do these kind of things, but at the same time, we try to let it go. Hopefully, hopefully, and decolonize it in a in a way where at least it's it's something different and it's a different experience. And so I wanted to honor the students, the staff, the faculty. I wanted to honor the people that are in that room because they're here with me today, and I'm just so so. Um, blessed to to be part of the the group really is the best way to put it. And, and Christopher, like you're in this space, you've got a PhD. You're like like a real smart doctor. Yeah. <laughs> well, it's it's interesting. I heard you talking this morning about social determinants of health, and I got my start in 1994 in a log cabin across from St. Eugene's Residential School uh, in my community where my aunts and uncles, my grandparents, their parents all went to school. And I moved home and people were talking about making that like a world-class resort, resort and casino. And mm. I had a background in economic development. And to me, that sounded terrible. Mm. <laughs> I don't know why that became like the foundation for all of our hopes and dreams in human capital and economic activity. Uh, but it was pretty clear that I didn't want to do that. And I was told, hey, we, we need you to find something else to fight for because fighting against that when we're working on it is uh, not really great for us. And so I said, yeah, let me work with the old people. Mm -hmm. uh, working on the language, the culture, I got to facilitate a meeting of about 20 of our elders from both sides of the border because the border does cut our community in half. And um, some researchers came in and said, Hey, just so you know, we got some funding from the government to rename a fish in Latin, and we want to talk to you about it, and we want your input. <laughs> and I knew it was going to be fun. <laughs> I've been yelled at by old ladies before. So I waited a couple of minutes, and the next thing you know, one of those women started kind of pounded on the table and said, we're desperately trying to save our language. Why the hell would we name a fish mm -hmm. from here that we've had since the beginning of time in a dead language? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And they pointed to a wall of three ring binders and they said, these are all reports that mm -hmm. folks like yourself who got your master's and your PhD and went to school and got famous on grants in our area mm -hmm. wrote. And we've never opened any of them because they don't mean anything to us. 20 some years later, when my community saw that I was working on some relatively high level social network analysis and, and some other ways of documenting resilience in our community, I was asked to come home and I guess weigh in on social determinants. So I said, why, why would I do it? If you let me convene a group, again, of our oldest, our most knowledgeable, our language speakers, our cultural people, then I'll tell you what they're saying. And the fact that no one is listening to them and you're mm -hmm, living in the same mm -hmm. community is a little bit shocking. Mm -hmm. So we got to start over with all of the research coming into our community. If you put together a research proposal that doesn't address some part of our nation vision statement, if your knowledge mechanism isn't calibrated to our internal research ethics or our language or our culture or our history, we're just, we just tell you now that you can't do your research. Mm -hmm. If you're not going to work with us to develop it, you don't get to do it there anymore. So it's kind of funny that I sit relatively close to that building 
and think about where it all started. And now the elders that I'm working with are the children, and in some cases, the grandchildren of those women that pounded on the table and said, stop giving us three ring binders that don't mean anything. Mm -hmm. Come here and design research with us that allows us to assert who we are in a meaningful way so that the data actually does something for both of our communities. So to be able to see that today and look at some of the learners that are here and hear about that kind of research happening uh, is, uh, is really great. Yeah. It's so amazing. And again, like when I'm hearing you tell that story, Christopher, I'm thinking about that listening piece, like that being ready to listen. And, and I think for me, we have, we have already said collectively as First Nations, Inuit, Métis people, um, certainly in what's colonially referred to as British Columbia, but across the country, we have been so clear in our direction and the specific actions that, um, that Canadians, that people living in British Columbia need to take uh, in order to uphold our inherent rights, like those rights that are there from time immemorial, and that's a teaching that uh, my dad's given me from the time that I was born is, you know, my girl, that is just, that is just the birthright that you have from the moment you took your first breath. That's nothing that the crown can give to you or bestow on you. But it's about listening to those very clear directions that have been given and, and just doing, doing it, mm -hmm. right? Like just doing the work. So um, I love hearing that, um, how specific, because that's one of the, I think one of the challenges too is how to um, create that action at a local level because every single local level is on First Nations territory on, you know, that has inherent teachings, laws, rights that are tied to those lands and waters. And so every person um, has that opportunity to learn the First Nations laws that govern the place that they now call home. Mm -hmm. And then if they want to work, they need to listen right and and work on it so that's the part that i find so interesting having been in the space for 20 years and i don't know if you guys like what you guys think about it but i've got this engagement fatigue because there's like this constant like how are we going to engage with this organization or that organization or and and it's wonderful there's an awareness that yes you need to include um indigenous voices perspectives in whatever it is that you're building um but it's also the the part that's giving me the fatigue is that I'm like, well, have you done your homework? Have you, yeah. you know, have you have you un took the time to understand what our vision is, what our mm -hmm. what our laws are, what our research protocols are? Um, and I'm finding when I when I'm asking that question now is that very few people have mm -hmm. done that homework yet. But I'm very happy to point them in that direction. Mm. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> right, yeah. Um, so you're not, you're not walking them and, and holding their hand, expecting them to do the work, to, to have the honor to engage. Yeah. Yeah. It's, you know what I love it is, so, and, and then you started us off and you use the word listen and you use the word silent and then um, all the work that you've been doing, Christopher, with respect to getting people to listen and, and then listening yourself. You kept saying, going back to going to the elders. Mm -hmm going to the the oldest woman which made me a little bit nervous because i'm starting to get gray hair and so now <laughs> you're old woman i'm like when, when do i fall into that category um and then you're talking about listening danielle and um and it, it's it, it's interesting because listening means that you can't be speaking and so then it's silent and you use the word silent in, in your opening an a which is such a powerful word to me so for for example um i i did a tedx talk and i i focused on this like this bizarre fake inauthentic celebration of when indigenous people are first the first indigenous person to do that the first metis person to do that the first inuk person to do that and, um, and so I remember I started off my TEDx talk, much to the chagrin of the people that were organizing it with, I started it off and I just didn't say anything. 
And it was this uncomfortable silence. And, and then I just said, you know, did you hear that? And I'm like, did you hear it? And the audience was like confused. And I said, could you imagine is if you were listening for advice, encouragement, um, knowledge of people that had done that before you, and that's all you heard is because there's no one that had done it before you. Someone in your family had not been to university to tell you, you know, you have to declare a major. I found that out like three months before I graduated. Like, <laughs> you know, all this sort of stuff. It's, it's interesting how, um, how there's so much silence if you just stop. And if people would just listen, they would realize that there's silence there. Um, and do not, it, it can be awkward, but there's so much to learn in that, in that, in that silence. Um, and it can be, it can be uncomfortable, but it can be precious. Um, and it can mean that you're, you're taking the time to hear, you're taking the time to listen, you're taking the time to process. And so when you're looking at this, this elusive chase for equity, mm -hmm. um, I think the fundamental thing is we're, we've heard it like from all of us in a different way, but listening, listening and being guided. Um, I think recognizing that the, the knowledge and the wisdom is on the people that are on the path ahead of us. And so it, it's, it's an honor to be here, but you're absolutely right. Like just the way the morning started off was um, just a breath of fresh air. And I was just like, that's something that's going to be there and, and, um, and so exciting. So um, I just think it's interesting that all of us were talking about listening. All of us were referring to the silence. All of us were talking about, and then you pointed it out, um, sometimes the, the inauthenticity of it. Um, when mm. you just want to say, check, the indigenous yes. voices were there, um, but you just hear this. Mm -hmm. And it's silent. I'm thinking too about that discomfort, that settler discomfort, because we're coming up against that a lot in the work that we're doing over the last year in our office. Um, white supremacy as a term is something that makes a lot of people uncomfortable. Um, and yeah, so we're having all these really interesting conversations about people, settler people feeling uncomfortable, um, having the commitment to wanting to uphold those foundational commitments and obligations, really being fearful of not wanting to say the wrong thing or do the wrong thing or make a mistake. Uh, and so just last week, we were in a, in a meeting with some senior health leaders here in BC, and that was one of my colleagues made that, com that, that comment of like, oh, I'm just, my, I'm bad with my words sometimes, and I, I'm just, I have a lot of discomfort. And it occurred to me, for those of us like what you're speaking to Nadine and I I don't want to speak for you Christopher but I imagine after many decades in the um, academy I've just had I could maybe count on one hand the number of times that I've felt comfortable in my training in my day-to-day -day work where I'm with people like me it's mm -hmm. very very rare um, and so that was my reflection back to my colleague was, um, good, great, feel uncomfortable. That's what you need to do. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> I'm like, let's share this uncomfortable load mm -hmm. because, you know, we've been carrying it for a really long time. So this is, you know, your, your opportunity to feel uncomfortable and navigate that complex space. And, um, and, and it's okay mm -hmm. as long as you kind of keep showing up and you're, you know, just committed to making things right, it'll, it'll be okay. Mm -hmm. And so I'm curious, Christopher, because now I'm thinking about the different researchers that have come, some that it sounds like have been, have been able to follow the directions and the protocol and others who were shut down. And so what, like, what have you witnessed in terms of that, that journey for them? Well, for myself, 
A couple of things I think are important. I'm not a pound on the table, rely on white guilt, volume, emotion, and repetition person. I'm a scientist. If you want to send your best technicians to talk about data and analysis and conclusions and dissemination and the shortfalls of projects that are designed without our input, I could do that all day. What I think is most helpful was when we started to realize that just about every researcher that comes to work with us, including researchers from this institution, they had no idea the dynamics of problem solving. It's very simple. Ukinetuitiash is a framework that we have for a group of people to solve problems in an unbiased, crowdsourced manner. The people didn't know that, so they show up, and when we would tell them, you can't do your research the way you want to, you have to work with a larger group. And what they say is, we don't have a budget for that. <laughs> I get paid, my crew gets paid, one of my students is getting their master's degree, I'm the distinguished chair of whatever research. <laughs> and what I remind them is, you don't have the data, the data is ours, never belongs to you. And if you're not listening, you shouldn't be here doing research. So we put together a series of videos, our three research methodologies from our community. If you're going to come here and do research, be aware of these dynamics. Mm -hmm. Because when you work with our elders, that means that's time they don't get to work with us. And if you're wasting our time, I'll tell you, and I won't be very nice about it. And I'll bring their family in to show who you're taking them away from. You can't calibrate what you're doing to what works for our community. You're actually wasting the very few precious resources we have left. Mm -hmm. Our language, our culture, our way of life is dancing up to the edge of extinction. Mm -hmm. If you're gonna put your next degree or letter or whatever accolade you think you're going to get in front of us making that knowledge a part of our future, we would call it, what we have to give to the next generation so they can stand there firmly. Mm. If you're in the way of that, you're actually doing harm. And you'll go back to your institution and get your degree or your competitive funding, or you'll get your raise or whatever it is. And we'll be sitting at home with a bunch of three ring binders that don't mean anything. Mm -hmm. There's a great emerging school of leadership that talks about performativity. And I'm just mentioning that because someone talked about it at the opening here. Mm -hmm. If what you're saying you're doing is different from what's happening, if you're not listening to those voices, if you don't understand that there's a silence there and there's a reason for it, that feeling you have, that's just the cognitive dissonance of not really knowing. You're, you're filling awkward spaces because that's what Western communicators do, right? When there's silence. Mm -hmm. When the first health researchers came to work with our community under our contemporary research structure, I told them it's going to be super awkward and there's going to be like two, three, four minute silences in the interviews and you need to not talk. <laughs> Don't awkwardly ramble about something <laughs> because sooner or later that person will come back to what they're saying. And in one day, the researchers that were funded by a CIHR grant said, you know what? Actually, we got through introductions. We did our first round of questions. We've done more here than we've done in some communities all week because we didn't fill that space. We didn't choke everything out. We didn't impose what we were thinking. We actually let the people say what was on their minds. And me telling them beforehand, everything they're gonna say has to be translated across two very different languages. Give them time. If you don't, they'll get frustrated and shut down. Emotional affective filters take over and we're done. And they said, there were so many times I wanted to say something. Mm -hmm. And I was like, tried to give them a hint and I just sat on my hands. <laughs> and at the end of the day, they were able to come up with some really rich data that represented both groups. And our conclusions and dissemination to our chiefs and councils represented both groups. It was one of the first times where the old people came and sat with us at the dissemination session and said, actually we did, we were a part of that and it was really good. And, and we mm -hmm. take some ownership over it as well. So. It's definitely more than a three ring binder. Mm -hmm. Amazing. When you were talking about um, or illuminating the precious resource of elders who hold those teachings, hold the language, 
all the ceremonies and and just that uh, the reality that if they're spending time with the researchers, they're not spending time with uh, their their community necessarily, their descendants. It made me think of an experience that I had once when I was in uh, Sri Lanka, working with um, the Veda indigenous peoples there, and their chief was telling me a story about how their traditional lands had been turned into a um, into a, a park, kind of a federal park, and they could no longer do their subsistence harvesting. They were being put into jail and put into prison, and so they had to do a lot of advocacy to, um, again, to assert their inherent rights. And at that time, they came together as a community, the leaders in the community, and made a decision to start sending their children from their main village to the school that was a few miles down the road um, where they could learn the mainstream language. And he was saying, you know, that was so important because they realized in that moment that they needed to have translators from their community, people that understood them and their way of being that could translate the sacredness, the beauty of that, the uniqueness to the outside world. And he was such a lovely person. And then he started to cry because he said, and every minute that they're at that school, they're not here with us. Mm -hmm. um, learning our ways. And I, I really think about it because I've got a beautiful little person with me today. Um, my female Anna, and we've got another um, daughter at home who's 10. And um, I think about it for, for them and for me, and that we have this really important work that we need to do in terms of um, being present for that dance at the edge of extinction. I love that phrase, Christopher. You know, and we have a very specific uh, roles and responsibilities that we need to carry out in order to, as I say, be disciplined about learning our languages. And so we're putting in so many extra hours, which is wonderful because it's good medicine. Um, and at the same time, we're, uh, you know, also trying to act as this bridge and translators to create space. Um, in these uh, mainstream settler colonial institutions. And, and sometimes um, it feels very heavy. And so one of the distinctions that is becoming more clear to me are these buckets of work that we hold in this, um, in this space of making things right, in the space of resetting relationships, in the space of upholding indigenous rights. Um, and so I see this sacred bucket of work uh, for us as, or I'll speak for myself, for myself as an Echodena Metis woman to be out on the land with my family, to learn my language, to um, learn as many ceremonies and protocols as possible. And, and we have very few, um, few remaining teachings around specific ceremonies and protocols in our very small community. Um, and then there's a bucket of work for uh, settler Canadians and the institutions. And, um, and that is the work of daylighting white supremacy and racism and the ways it shows up every single day and being disciplined about um, arresting it. Uh, and so, I think for a really long time, we've been, we, now I'm saying collectively as Indigenous people, we've been invited into spaces much like, mm -hmm. much like this, um, or into UBC, or into mm -hmm. the Ministry of Health, or wherever we get invited into, and we've been asked and actually loaded with this settler bucket of work. Um, First Nations Health Authority is a great example of that, where, um, you know, they came into being and then so many different people kind of said, oh, well, FNHA is here. That's their work. Mm -hmm. 
No, <laughs> no. Um, arresting white supremacy and racism is very much the work of regional health authorities and of doctors and nurses and clerks and um, you know everybody that makes the health system uh, makes the health system work. So, yeah. So thank you for sharing that teaching, Christopher, and and thinking about it in that way because I um, we are still here. And we are here at this time that feels particularly um, tenuous. Mm -hmm. um, and Maeve and I were talking as we were driving in, we were talking about um, being grateful to be on Musqueam territory. Mm -hmm. So as we were driving through the, the endowment lands, the parks, mm -hmm. um, and, I, and we were, so we were saying our prayers and we were saying, you know, we're so grateful to the ancestors, the descendants, the medicines of these lands and waters, and we'll do our best to tread softly while we're here and thank you for the gifts. And, and we started talking about ancestors and descendants and it was really interesting because May was trying to wrap her head around who's an ancestor, who's a descendant. And mm -hmm. so we were talking about before and after and she said, okay, so she said, so we're going to be ancestors. And I was like, absolutely. And that's why for this brief speck of time that we're here, um, you know, we really need to do our best to honor our ancestors and hold up as many of those teachings as we can um, revive from our blood memory. I love that Nola brought that into the space this morning because, um, you know, those teachings have been so violently ripped out of our communities um, but they're there so trying to find ways to um, revive them yeah Let's so see. huge you know it's um it's interesting and christopher when you brought it up in terms of researchers being in your community and every second that they spend with the elders the elders are away from their community members who need them and rely on them to to help carry that that culture that language through to the to the next generation it's it's interesting because i'm really struggling um you'll notice the audience probably noticed that christopher spoke eloquently in his traditional language and then danielle your language is like incredible um and i know you've been learning it and it's it's interesting. I'm I took uh, Anishinaabe lessons like for the past year, and I'm not even comfortable speaking a sentence. And um, and it's interesting because like I, I feel like I've been pretty darn productive this year, based on UBC standards. And I think I've worked pretty darn hard. Um, even based on my community and and my patients who come from nations across northern BC, um, I've fought like hell to get like resources and health services for people that were turned away or to and all of that and and um, and I feel like you, you know it's, don't you sometimes feel like you're doing all this like with your Ministry of Health or or and and it's taking time away from, from language. And so I stand up on a stage and I say, language is so important. And I keep saying it over and over and over again. And I run out of time at the end of the day to do that. And so working with my daughter um, and she just, she is, she's much better at uh, Ojibwe than I am. Um, it's it's interesting so what i've started to do in my little i don't know my, my rebel way is you have to at ubc produce an annual report what i say is i have to sh show that i deserve to exist and it's like what how many students have i taught how many hours have i taught what did my students say on a scale of one to four or one to five or depending on what the course is that i like how did my students mark me? What grants did I get? How much money was it for what project? How many publications did you put out? 
you know, what awards did you win? What committees did you sit on? For how many hours? Like seriously, you, you just document it. So like, like what did you do when you woke up to when you fell asleep? So then I started like, I started putting, you know what? I was gifted an eagle feather. And it was passed back to me saying like, what the heck's an eagle feather? Like, like <laughs> I was like, actually, you know what? That was one of the most, that is one of the most special, special moments of my life, not my career, my life. When my chief, who like my Sagamok Anishinaabek First Nation is like way over on the other side of the country for people that are not in Canada or don't know. So I don't get back home very often. But when I go back home and my chief says, welcome home. I know that I don't even deserve to be welcomed home most of the time. Because I'm over here in a different province in a different community working with other First Nations doing research with other First Nations and not speaking my language with my chief and my elders. But for that gratitude for them to say, welcome home and to give me an eagle feather, I'll tell you one thing, that bloody thing stayed on my CV and it is, a, it is gonna stay on there and they can take, UBC can take anything off they want, but they're sure it's not, they're not taking my eagle feather off. And, uh, and I think it's neat for to have those conversations with people like neurosurgeons <laughs> and general surgeons <laughs> and kind of explaining like, here's what it is. And then I think we're in a space now, like you said, where um, they're listening and they're saying like, that's really cool. And I can tell you, I don't know when it happened, but there was a time when nobody would, would say it was cool. And so I think we're working our way at UBC and in the world of academia where they may not get it completely, mm -hmm. but they're moving in a space where um, they're listening. Mm -hmm. And maybe sometimes they're okay in the silence. Maybe it's awkward. Heck, maybe they read my annual report and noticed I had an eagle feather on my annual report. I don't know. But uh, it's, it's amazing how... Um, how do you split yourself up into a thousand pieces and then listen to what you're actually saying? I think it's the biggest challenge I have right now. Yeah, we had a, we presented at a health research conference sometime before the pandemic. It's like pre pandemic and post, I don't even remember how many years ago it was. <laughs> I remember someone, the chief technology officer got up and said something about well, the community engagement doesn't get looked at the same way as academic publications. But I was one of the keynotes and I was like, that's all I do. So why do you even have me here if it's not important to do that? And they said, well, it's just really doing the CCV, right? You've got to get mm -hmm. on and do the very technical. It's so fancy. Yeah. And I was like, first off, if you're in charge of that, it's a simple conditional, right? It's an if then. <laughs> If my paper was published more than five years ago, then it doesn't matter. Mm -hmm. But then I did five years of community outreach and stuff that you say isn't important, but you won't accept my paper. So you're actually the, the chief technical officer is the person to make that change. I remember I hit him really hard with that and the rest of my colleagues on that project, I looked over and they were like, <laughs> <laughs> And uh, it came up again recently because we were talking about that. What, what does it mean when you have some kind of non-traditional metric or milestone or waypoint mm -hmm. for your research? And I want to just kind of close my thoughts out by sharing what we decided to do. All of our federally funded researchers came over to ask the question, what does a healthy community look like? They took direction from our elders from day one. They went through our research ethics paperwork process, which is above and beyond, and in my opinion, more important than CIHRs or UBC or UBCO or whoever else it was. They came over, they watched the videos, they had the conversations, they answered a bunch of questions before they even showed up. And when we started talking with our elders about how, how do we end this? What, what, do, what do we do here? Because we knew we were getting ready to apply for additional funding. And they said, have them show up at this time during May. We'll do um, our final interviews. We'll talk about the research 
amongst the elders, and then we will have a feast and we will give it to all four chiefs and councils. We also knew that that was when we were digging our bitter root and we worked with our chief to make sure that was okay, we could have it all at the same time. And I remember the researchers came to me the day before and said, like all wide eyed, excited researchers, will we be able to go? And I said, it's not up to me, it's up to our bitter root chief, you need to go talk to that woman right there and you need to ask her. So in the morning, and my cousin, who I've been doing research with for a long time, Afterwards, he was like, I, I give him a 12% chance. I said, I give him an 8% chance. Sure enough, the next morning, the chief comes in and they're organizing things and the researchers go over and, and they asked if they would be, they said, we will do anything. If you need us to set up chairs, if you need us to cook, whatever you need, we wanna do. And the, um, the chief talked to them for a couple minutes and then the, everyone's kind of scattered and what the chief had told them was good, you can dig for me so I can sit with the kids and teach them how to peel. Mm. And while we were out there for the day, we had kids on the school bus running up the road, kicking up dust. It's one of the best pictures I've ever taken. It looked like an old school cartoon or something. Mm. And at the end of the day, we took the, the uh, basket that had the bitterroot in it. And we had everybody grab on, three generations, researchers, community members, chiefs, counselors, professors, whoever it was, everyone was there. And that was my social media picture because it was what I'd been kind of hoping and dreaming of since the first time I sat with those old ladies in 1994. And that picture was shared by uh, the Lieutenant Governor for the province of British Columbia, who then later um, awarded us one of the, the inaugural BC Reconciliation mm. Award and when she started her tour of the province focusing on indigenous communities, she started in our community to sit down and have a meal with our elders. Mm. We gave her a framed picture uh, of that same image because she had shown it quite widely on, on her social media. And that, that was it. That's the milestone. How many researchers get to put on their CV that they were invited to pick Bitterroot and be a part of that feast? Mm -hmm. It doesn't show up as one of those outcomes. Mm -hmm. But when we started focusing on that, we noticed that we did get good funding. And we got people that recognized this is like getting a high ranking award somewhere. This is mm -hmm. a community with the very few resources left inviting them in to be a part of these things. So I just want to kind of end by just mentioning that. The more you work with the community, the more you help create something with them, they want to be a part of what you're doing. They want you to see those things, but it has to be on their terms, on their time scales, and their units of analysis. Those are the minimum data elements. Those are the boundary objects that we all relate to one another over. And if you're not, and those aren't part of your proposal, or your research methodology or your specific research questions, you're actually taking away from the probability of us being here in the future. I, yeah. mm -hmm. I see. Christopher, what a wonderful note to <clears throat> help us transit to the next part of this. And I want to thank you all, and I'll, I'll do that momentarily. I'm Bob Willard <clears throat> from the Rural Coordination Center of BC. UBC and uh, and tough and the generosity that this conversation has shown is now being extended to everyone in the room and outside uh, the speakers would like to engage with you embrace you in the dialogue so whether it's a question whether it's an observation uh, please again be um, aware that there may be many people so uh, we don't want a long exposition, but we want to know uh, how you can engage with some of the very profound thoughts that are had here <clears throat> and how some of those thoughts and those expressed experiences might play out in your own nations. So we're going to go into silence until somebody says something. Judy, we can we get a, a microphone? Do you want this one? 
Is this for you? Sure. I'm Judy Lewis, and I would love to go into my whole history, but I'm not going to do it because we don't have time, and I'm going to go to a brushing. But I want to say that I'm deeply and emotionally affected by this whole conversation. And I've been working with communities for my entire professional life. And I agree with you, nobody ever cares about what we're doing in terms of developing relationships. And without those relationships, what we do is not of any relevance whatsoever. So I, I thank all of you for sharing with us. Um, and I hope I have an opportunity to speak with you later. Thank you. I'm interested, thank you very much. Uh, I'm interested to hear when communities, when elders are asked, what are your pressing research questions? What's, what do they say? Uh, well, we have a process called where when a researcher wants to do some research in our community, our nation council identifies uh, whether it is a student, whether it's someone currently doing research, to be that bridge to facilitate understanding before people even show up. And usually during that process, that community member will talk with researchers and identify what's most important because they are also the kind of differential between that Western research, but also that group of elders that know, here's something that's related that's important. So again, it's not a static answer, it's very organic and it causes you have to kind of ebb and flow and question and listening and asking for clarification. And that community member has to be supported because both sides can tend to be um, frustrated. They can tend to ask questions that are beyond the scope of what they may know at the time and they have to translate a lot of ideas. But I can guarantee you for every question that you might have that you want to do research on, one of the elders from our community over their lives have wanted to study the same thing. So it's usually very simple when someone says, fire ecology was one of those ones. They, someone wanted to come and talk about if we ever used fire to manage resources. And there were a bunch of them that not only had families that did that, but there were stories and songs and all kinds of interesting things. So right away, it was like a lake wildfire. It picked up really quickly mm -hmm. when people wanted to do health research. What makes a healthy community is something that that group had already talked about. So I guarantee you someone in our community has already talked about something and it's just a matter of getting your research request out there. No matter what it is, we had somebody that wanted to do like some orchestral work for an opera and one of our community members was like, I, I know a little bit about that and I want to do that. So even when we get requests that people are have no idea it goes to that group and there's someone that's given it some thought and wants to be a part of it yeah it's a great question you know what the other thing too is, is is one is the researchers going to the community and putting it out there and doing it in in, in the eloquent way that Christopher just described which is so like respectful um, but also community members reach out and communities and leaders reach out um, and it's a, a lot of requests come um, to to me uh, as the First Nations Health Authority Chair in Cancer and Wellness because the communities know what's happening in the community and so they'll say you know there's this there is a higher rate of stomach cancer in our communities we think that there's a link with this environment and breast cancer in our communities or we're concerned that you know everyone seems to get this cancer diagnosed really late like why is that and so and there's part of that and and so i think if if you're if it's an institution that does research and or a group or an organization that does research is having that capacity to be able to take those requests is also really valid and really important um, at the Center for Excellence in Indigenous Health, we, we try to do that, and Drew St. Laurent is here, and he, like, he just gets emails all over the place about everything, and then he fires it out to Patty Spittle, who's one of our key researchers in the, in the community, but, you know, there's, there's so much, um, there's, there's a real, I think, need to make it so that the communities can lead it, so you're not even going in and saying, I'm interested in this, are you, you know, but the communities can say, 
we know that this is an issue. We know this is a problem. This is one of our priorities. And we should make it so that the universities are responsible for being there and having a way that the communities can kind of say, Ane, I know based that, that you're interested in this. Would you help us with this? And the communities being even able to start that partnership because um, that makes it really, really receptacle where someone has an idea, they can reach out communities have an idea they can reach out and that's when the partnerships start in a real the most natural way I think there's also a tendency for people to get funded for research it's I, I'm the primary investigator if you're not looking at promoting a community member mm -hmm. as a co-primary investigator you need to not send a research proposal mm -hmm. you are you are de facto from the beginning saying we're in charge Mm -hmm. UBCO got that right. When they came to our community to work what they were wanted to work on, mm -hmm. the first thing they said was, we have a primary investigator on our side and we want someone from your community and those two will be equals moving forward so that everyone's concerns are represented the same. That's the first time that happened. Every other time it was, well, I'm the distinguished chair. <laughs> Nobody cares what you're a distinguished chair of. That doesn't mean yeah. anything in our community. If there's not a primary investigator from our community, you don't get our data. If you don't have our data, you can do archival research. If you want to do something that works, it's got to work from both sides. Mm -hmm. And very few institutions continue, half the research requests I get, we respond, and they, they don't go forward with it because they can find someone else that will do it without having to cede any of that power or that title or, or any of that. Yeah, great point. Thank you. I, that makes me, oh, sorry, um, Bob, I was just going to add, because I think, um, it makes me, or I'm reminded of something that uh, Joe Gallagher says, the former CEO of the First Nations Health Authority, about thinking about Indigenous rights and how to uphold Indigenous rights. And really, it comes down to who's making the decisions, like who ultimately are the decision makers, um, and how critical it is that um, that we, as First Nations Inuit Métis people, are included in whatever the decision is, even if it's outside of research as just a general principle yeah. um, about a really simple way forward. Yeah. <laughs> Who's making the decisions? Thank you very much. I have three people lined up, so we'll... Hi, uh, I'm Kamaini from India. Um, I really connected. I've uh, uh, one state in India is Chhattisgarh, where there's one city where I did the fieldwork, where in one village there, 36 languages mm -hmm. and I was wondering how do you deal with this uh, concept of dying languages and the observation which through my uh, field research was that the intergenerational conflict of the lure of western culture so you have the elderly who are preserving but then this whole the, the Sri Lankan uh, thing when you said that the corporates are coming up and similar thing is happening in India the corporates are trying to take away their land mm -hmm. uh, through all, all those so all those violations are ha happening so how how are you maintaining that balance or is there any out of the box things you have in mind? yeah well I can share a little bit about what what I no, or think um, this for me is one of the gifts of COVID-19, right? It, it had obviously lots of harms, but one of the gifts for our family was the transition to Zoom. So all of a sudden we were able to access language yeah. programs that we couldn't have before. So things that were put on by Fort Nelson First Nation that were previously hosted only in the community, which is 20 hours from where I live. Um, and now we can join on Zoom. So that's one of the ways that we've been able to access those teachings. Um, I would also say that here anyway, the First People's Cultural Council has had uh, a really big hand in terms of creating uh, mentorship programs. Um, and for myself, so basically the mentorship program will pair um, a, a language speaker, somebody who's fluent with somebody who's trying to learn, and then they're both remunerated, they're both given a stipend to work together. Um, one of the barriers for me, again, where I live on Lekwungen territories, which is very far from our home territory, is that there are no fluent um, Dennis speakers in my area. So, for example, that wouldn't work for us. But I do know that's been a really successful program for people that can pair um, and, and recognize the importance of um, 
just reviving or maintaining the continuity of, of language across the generations. Okay, so I've got three people lined up still, so that's great. Okay. Um, I, I just want to say to the, to the speakers, um, three speakers, that um, I'm just humbly touched and really moved. My name is um, Teresa, and I'm an Indigenous woman from Cape Town, South Africa, I'm in Canada, mm. 30 years. Mm. And Nadine, it's such an honor to, to listen to you today. David uh, talked a lot about you, and I want to say that I'm a, a frequent visitor in your community at uh, Sega Mark. I've done a lot of work wow. there. Mm. I have uh, uh, beautiful friends there. And um, also, one of the things that really touched me so, so deeply and so profoundly is um, just how the, the three of you um, sharing with us, but um, and and sometimes deepen heartfelt, you know, uh, um, information. But just the honesty and all I felt was being affirmed as an indigenous woman as as well. And um, and I'm like, how is it possible that? You know, they're giving us this beautiful information, but um, they're also holding space for us at the same time. Mm. It was it was so profound and just so healing. So, Jimmy Witch. Jimmy Witch. Wow. Thank you. Let's all reflect on the relationships that uh, happen for Stance and, and hope that over the next few days you will explore. Uh, with the people you meet, where those possibilities are. And, and when we have a little more time, Nadine may tell you about how she introduces her class to such uh, <laughs> possibilities of, of, of commonality that was unexplained before. Please. <clears throat> and then Lionel. <clears throat> Um, thank you. I also want to thank you so much. It was very, very, um, what a wonderful way to start the conference. Um, I think um, I, I'm a family physician from uh, uh, Quebec and uh, a um, non-Indigenous faculty lead for Indigenous um <clears throat> affairs yeah. and so we still don't have our first <clears throat> indigenous uh, faculty member in uh, Sher at sherbrooke university so <clears throat> i was wondering if you could talk a bit about the com the commonality that we all would have in this room and across all our institutions which is that our relationship with indigenous communities around the world is not just about doing research or academic activities. So just to go into a little bit about, and, and <clears throat> really appreciate everything that has been said about research, research in the very wider sense of search for truth and for knowledge. I, I wanted to, my question is about um, social responsibility, social accountability of our institutions. <clears throat> Basically, in my humble path of, of learning, <clears throat> if in this day and age, if you are not as, a, as a, a white settler whose ancestors were slave owners in the Southern states, if I'm not part of the solution, I'm part of the problem. Yeah. And so can you talk about allyship? I was very touched by the fact that <clears throat> yes, we have to do we have to do things with and support everything being done by the indigenous friends, but they're exhausted mm -hmm. and and being re-traumatized in so many ways. So if you could speak to that, and I'm talking too long. Mm -hmm. Do you guys mind if I start? Because I have some very strong feelings about this. Okay. <laughs> very strong feelings and thoughts about it. Um, thank you, Masi, for your comment and your question. And I, 
I think sometimes we we lose the thread when we talk about um, social accountability or diversity, equity and inclusion, or even Indigenous health. I think we've lost the thread when we go down that path. I think there are very clear legal obligations, very, very clear in Western frameworks, legal obligations. We've got a framework um, in UNDRIP and in BC, the Declaration uh, on the Rights of Indigenous Peoples Act. We have uh, over 500 specific direct actions that have been directed by Indigenous peoples, and this is in a Canadian context. So really the work is at the is in that final bucket which is just taking up and being aware of and following those directions and instructions and i think at that point is when this is the place that we're getting to at the office of the pho is that once we've done our homework once we've gone for any given topic and looked through all of those 500 recommendations we know which ones and we've kind of done a few steps in that direction that's when we can go to our partners and say how is how does this look to you are we on the right path so we're not asking them to do the heavy lifting. We're saying, okay, we've got these legal obligations. So this isn't an act of benevolence. This isn't something we're gonna do because we feel like it today. This is something we're gonna show up every day and be disciplined about taking anti-racist actions by looking at those specific directions that we've already received in the Truth and Reconciliation Report in the Missing and Murdered Indigenous Women and Girls Report. Um, and the Two-Spirit LGBTQIA plus um, action plan uh, in the In Plain Sight report here in BC on anti-Indigenous racism. Um, and, and we're gonna show and demonstrate our trustworthiness by, you know, by saying, we listened, we heard you say this thing. We heard you say that, for example, with In Plain Sight, that we want recommendation 15, we wanna have, um, you know, a thoughtful, Indigenous pandemic response plan going forward that upholds the self determination of Indigenous peoples. So we heard you, we listened, and this is what we're doing so far. How are we doing? And then we can seek feedback. So those are some of my very strong thoughts on that yeah. <laughs> topic. And I don't know if they resonate for Nadine and Christopher, but that's what we're trying to do. I think I think it's great. It certainly registers, and and but I can even answer it from a different view, viewpoint. So those you can those are. I used to go into meetings with like, for example, when we were creating the, the Center for Excellence in Indigenous Health with the the TRC report, photocopies of it, and if there was resistance, I would just like put it down on the and just say, okay, then if you don't want to listen to me because I'm junior faculty and I, I'm just like. Here you go. Try that one. And so I love those are all really, really critical and thousands of stories that like millions of tears mm -hmm. went into those documents that look like a, something you can put on a shelf. So totally, so totally agree with that. I also think that it's just, um, it's just a shift. It's a shift. There was a time, for example, cultural safety and humility training. Mm -hmm. There was a shift that if you had that in your medical school or nursing school or pharmacy or midwifery or social work or nursing, like all of that, you were forward thinking, you were, what a compassionate faculty, like, oh my goodness, aren't you guys just amazing? It shifted. And so now it's like, where is it? Where is it? How are you training future healthcare professionals in this country, in this province, in your faculty, in your profession? Because you better be doing it. And we're not at the point where you better be doing it or you're not going to be able to practice. But I think we're approaching that. Mm -hmm. and, and, I'm, and that's very, very exciting. So it's sort of like it's, it's starting to move into that, that space. And that's awesome. And then I'll finish with you can even look at it a different way. There is an elder that um, really helps to guide me. And, and she simply put it this way. You know, one thing you can do, Nadine, is just look at Indigenous is not the blood that flows through your veins. It, it's what's in your heart. And that helps to explain people in my life like Patty Spittle. Mm -hmm. 
you know, someone like that, like that helps you, you kind of go Patty Spittle for those don't, don't know, she's a researcher, she's at our center, she's here at UBC, it helps to explain that and it helps to explain everyone who says I want to be an ally and, and they're there for the right reasons, for the pur that purpose and, um, and you could just feel it, you could feel it, it matters to them. Another person that for some reason is coming to my mind because I've seen him is Damien, Damien like just put up your hand because man you just, I, you exude allyship or you just, you just exude passion and like just like just a genuine genuine desire to be part of the solution and so i think that you can look at allyship in a bunch of different ways um and i think you can use tools if you're an ally and you need to pull other people along but i think sometimes if you're a, a true ally look in the mirror uh, and know that you are part of the solution because reconciliation means everybody all in, all in, like jump in the deep end, meet you at the shallow end kind of thing. Miigwech for asking that. May I say something provocative? Because yeah. I, I'm troubled by the word ally and um, I'm looking at Kate Youngblood, who's my white lady sidekick in the Unlearning and Undoing project. So we've had this conversation many times over the last year. And I think where I'm landing, because um, it gives me harm alarms. Like when I hear that term ally, allyship, my harm alarms go off because I don't know what it means. I don't know how to, like I've, I've seen allies doing allies doing work that's very harmful. So mm -hmm. I'm I'm cautious about it and I'm starting to think that my trouble with it is that it creates this dynamic that somehow again as indigenous peoples were less than were you know we need help right like in some way it's creating a bit of this dynamic that we need you to be allies with us. And I'm thinking again of um Dave Frank and Nola up this morning and just the tremendous gift and generosity of their wisdom and I'm thinking about like how incredible we are like we are as unique First Nations Inuit Métis people here but around the world and um and I I think we actually like I th I'd like to be an ally to settlers who are doing the hard work mm -hmm. of arresting their white supremacy and racism. Like I'd like to be your ally as opposed, and I don't know if that shifts the dynamic. I'm really spitballing now, guys. Mm -hmm. um, this is a very, yeah, just stream of consciousness. But um, yeah, I, I find the word troublesome and I'm not quite sure why I think it has to do something with that, that somehow it diminishes or blinds again all of those um, strengths and sacred beauties that we carry uh, just as who we are. That is a very <laughs> profound, <laughs> practical challenge to, to all of us in this room. I, I, I'm going to take a bit of a risk here because I've been trying to see how much caffeine deficiency, and <laughs> if that is offset, which I think it is, by the fascination with this conversation. So I'd like to proceed with another question from South Africa or another observation from South Africa. And then I'm afraid we will have to close because I'm aware that I'm standing between you and coffee. Coffee. So Kaisa Kai Gangan, that is the way that the first peoples in the region of Cape Town where I come from would have said thank you. And it's a kind of higher grade thank you. Um, it reflects a deep gratitude. And so I really want to say Kaisa Kai Gangan this morning. I'm deeply challenged by the conversation that you put on the table because I don't, because the question I want to ask, and perhaps it's just a comment at this stage and maybe pick it up with you at the break, is the challenge, so one of these, one of the problems with these conversations in North America is that it's often about a minority seeking their assertion in a, in a dominant majority mm -hmm. culture. Mm -hmm. Our problem is different in that we're trying to democratize this conversation to centralize it in the discourse of the country. But perhaps my challenge has been, and I don't know how many of you have followed the, the challenge of the, the Black River confluence in Cape Town where Amazon is about to build their headquarters. Part of the challenge is trying to identify because the geography of these First Nations has disappeared and they don't occupy those spaces anymore. How do you work out who the voice is that that's authentic 
Mm. And how, how do you engage that voice? So we, the reason I know Kaisikai Kangans is because I'm new in the area. I thought, let me just learn something that's nice. Um, mm -hmm. So it's a bit of a superficial engagement at this stage. Mm. But I wonder how you, this authenticity, um, how mm. does one ensure that you're being authentic in the engagement, which I think is a very, is a fundamental question. But also, how do you decide that this conversation is the authentic one? Mm. There's an interesting correlation there for my community because there's an area, the Central and West Kootenays, named after the Kootenays, which is what we are. But there's traditionally three indigenous groups there. But once the last reserve was decommissioned, there were no indigenous people there. So as our allies, as our industry partners, as our educational partners wanted to jumpstart those conversations, it was really difficult for them. Uh, there's one indigenous group still on the lake, uh, but they're an hour away. There's another group that's on the southern side of the American border who were recently recognized by the Supreme Court of Canada as still existing. There is another group that was shifted even further west and they have claims to the area. So one of the things that we tell the colleges, the universities, the museums, anyone working with us, you've got to you've got to mention all the groups. And you've got to rotate it. Don't always do it in the same order because you're always telling someone they're last and someone else they're first. And people will get all up in arms about that. So I know that that's a difficult situation. And who do we find that's a descendant from or who do we look at that was traditionally? That's really difficult. But if it's a kind of a, a broad overview or knowing generally who they were, at least starting with that and making sure that people know that's a very open and honest thing that a lot of people don't get up and start. I haven't heard anyone from Nelson get up and say, we don't really know what to do because we don't. It's always they try and remember, but it's always the same group. Whichever activists are the loudest are always first. Mm -hmm. And whoever is long term conversation in science and technology is always last. And I said, hey, you just got to rotate it. All three groups have claim. Mm -hmm. All three groups are valid. All three groups are there. You've got to find some way to, to balance that profound advice that I'm sure is applicable around the world in so many <laughs> relationships and thank you for that. Because this is a virtual conference, I'm going to push us a little bit. Uh, we have uh, a, a comment or, or an engagement uh, online and I'd like to very briefly meet that if everybody agrees and, uh, and then we will close so that you can get to coffee. I'm just reading it out here. Amazing session. I'm Zarni from Myanmar. Is there any examples and experiences the speakers can share about maintaining the indigenous right and improving indigenous health in a fragile state like Myanmar? Oh. Wow. Oh. <laughs> yeah. That's that that's a great question and a hard question. It, but you know what it's interesting in a way it's the easiest question because I think what we've all been saying is just because I'm First Nations doesn't mean that I have any expertise, any knowledge, any understanding of an Indigenous population outside of my lived experience. Mm -hmm. And just because I'm from Sagamok doesn't mean that I would walk in there and and presume to know what my community that, that welcomes me home needs or wants or prioritizes. I think it's the listening. And, and it's, Christopher started off like going to the elders, the people who hold the knowledge, the people that are our link. Um, and is that the easy way out? Or is that the only way in to start the conversation? I, I would love actually the response from the person who asked the question what they think about that. In. I'm not sure if they're connected. Would it be all right just while they're maybe typing? I just um, hearing the question and hearing your response, Nadine reminded me of working in um, briefly meeting a medicine woman in Guatemala mm -hmm. and who was describing her work and all of the you know very sacred ceremonies that she carried out and being under persecution by their government and um and the ways in which 
people from her communities had been hurt, like violently hurt by the by the government for practicing their traditional ceremonies. And so she was just describing, and I had learned during my time there, just what a tremendous risk it was. Mm -hmm. Not unlike what it would have been in, like here in what's colonially referred to as Canada, um, when those parts of the Indian Act were being enforced, um, you know, not that long ago. Um, my question to her, this is almost 20 years ago, you know, because I immediately was thinking, how do you do this work? Like, that sounds scary, mm -hmm. you know, like that seems very scary. And I just remember she was so calm and so serene. And she was like, this is just who I am. And this is the work that I need to do. And so the creator's given me this work to do and I do it. And so she, um, yeah, was just so focused on like that truth mm -hmm. um, and that, um, yeah, her calling that the rest of it she endured mm -hmm. because that was her her path. And so I don't think that's necessarily a response to this question, but it's what yeah. came to my mind was mm -hmm. thinking about that there are these universal laws, I think universal truths um, that while we are all so distinct and unique, we are still one in some of those fundamentals and and we are still here. Mm -hmm. We are still here. Let's all of us pause and reflect over the last uh, hour and a half of the things that we've been privileged to see, the honesty, the clarity, the compassion and the passion <laughs> that uh, that um, this conversation opened up for all of us and how that might apply so i uh, want you to uh, to join me in in, uh, in thanking the uh, the panel uh, and there's another word that that hangs uh, above the table that is both a call and an expression of this conversation and that's humility and uh, we thank you for that so much